Make you listen to all of it. That's got to be one of the longest intros ever, hasn't it? <laughs> you know, people think time is a constant, but when you're waiting for something, it's not. <laughs> that intro seems a lot longer than I remember. I'll move that out of the way because I'll fall over it. I want that. <laughs> all right. Come on, we're just going to pray. Father, tonight as we make space for you to speak into our lives, be present, be clear, and help us to change in Jesus' name. Now that song came from a guy called Meatloaf. Uh, Some of you generationally will think that's a silly name. Well, yeah, it is, but... um, And was released in 1992, and... uh, The words of the song intrigue me. I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. Now, Meatloaf thinks that it's extremely clear what he wouldn't do for love, because he talks about, I wouldn't leave you and all that stuff. But I think he is um, kind of obsessed in his own clarity of something that really maybe is not that clear. And uh, it's given me foundation for what I want to talk to you tonight about the fact that In the issue of love and our interrelationship with people, what stops you doing what love demands? I find myself becoming more and more uh, critically obsessed in my life with authentic Christianity. Not the how many times you were in church kind of Christianity. Not the can you come into church and raise your arms kind of Christianity, not that I've read the Bible 15 times kind of Christianity, but but the kind of Christianity that, that actually expresses who Jesus was and what it was that Jesus taught, because when we live that way, there are some things we can't do. There are some ways we can't treat each other. There are some relationships we can't leave, and there are some things we can't overlook. So my question to you tonight is, what stops you doing what love demands? I'm going to read you something. On, November, on a November evening in 2004, a 40-year-old New Yorker by the name of Victoria Ruvalo was driving to her home on Long Island. She doesn't remember the silver Nissan approaching from the opposite direction. She remembers nothing of the 18-year-old boy leaning out of the window, holding, of all things, a frozen turkey. He threw it at her windscreen. The 20-pound bird crashed through the glass, bent the steering wheel inward, and shattered her face like a dinner plate on concrete. She was left fighting for her life in the ICU. She survived... Her face didn't, at least not as it had been. Her jaw wired, one eye gone, her skull bolted together with titanium plates. She can't look in a mirror without a constant reminder of her hurt. Nine months after her disastrous November night, she stood face to titanium bolted face with her offender in court. Ryan Cushing was no longer the cocky, turkey-tossing kid in the Nissan. He was trembling, tearful, and apologetic. For New York City, he had come to symbolize a generation of kids out of control. People packed the room to see him get his comeuppance. The judge's sentence enraged them. Only six months behind bars. Five years probation, some counseling and community service. The courtroom erupted. Everyone objected. Everyone, that is, except Victorio Ruvalo. The reduced sentence was her idea. The boy walked over and she embraced him. In full view of the judge and the crowd, she held him tight, stroked his hair. He sobbed and she spoke. I forgive you. I want your life to be the best it can be. She allowed grace to shape her response. God gave me a second chance at life, and I passed it on, she says. If I hadn't let go of that anger, I'd be consumed by this need for revenge. 
Forgiving him helps me to move on. Her mishap led to her mission. I'm trying to help others, but I know for the rest of my life I'll be known as the turkey lady. Could have been worse, he could have thrown a ham, then I'd be known as Miss Piggy. <laughs> Victoria Ruvalo knows how to fill a basin. What do I mean by that? I might explain in a moment. You see, it's easy to say that we love, and nobody wants to be labelled unloving. But love, or its absence, is displayed in our actions, and not our words. The Bible tells us that we are to love in deed, and not in words. I am deeply concerned that we excuse things in our life that really are an expression that we love in words, but not in deeds. If anyone had a reason not to love in deed, this lady, Victoria Ruvalo, had that reason, but she didn't love in words, she loved in deed. And I have to say to every one of you who says you are a follower of Jesus, if you can't love in deed, then I don't think really you're a follower of Jesus. Certainly not the Jesus of the Bible and the Jesus who I am seeking so deeply to know. That brings me to the event in the lives of Jesus and his closest followers that I want to talk about. Let me say at this point that the actions of love can be anything from a simple hug to truthful words that hurt. In uh, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament... In chapter 12, it says, who the Lord loves, he disciplines. Or in other words, sometimes we have to speak the truth, but do it in love, because when we hear the truth, it helps us to change. So we mustn't have a view tonight of love is avoiding anything that hurts, because often love really hurts when it matters, and Jesus was not afraid to hurt in the context of love in order to bring change to our lives, because if we stay the same and do not change, then how can our lives change and we make a difference with others? And so in John chapter 13, there's a story. I, I'm not going to read it from the Bible. I, I'm, I'm going I'm to talk it out to you, but you can go and read it if you wish in John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. It's, it's Jesus' last supper with his disciples before his crucifixion. It's called the Last Supper because they were going to have supper and it was the last one that Jesus would have with his disciples. So I guess the writer couldn't really think of a cleverer name, but that's why it was the Last Supper. And in that supper, Jesus met with his disciples and they had rented a room because it was the Feast of Passover, which in Jewish culture was extremely important. And they were going to share the Passover meal on this feast of Jewish Feast of Passover, which happened to be the time when Jesus would give his life for the sins of the world. So in this last relational interaction with his disciples, this last meal... They all go to this upper room, up the stairs, into the room. In the corner of the room, there is a basin, a jug, and a towel. Everybody who walked into that room to that day knew what the, what the basin, the jug, and the towel were for. They understood the significance and the importance, but everybody walked past the basin in the corner and took their seat at the meal, including Jesus. But Jesus did it for a reason, which you'll see in a moment. And they all sit down to have their supper. And at the beginning of that story in John chapter 13, in verse 1 it says, Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. So, so Jesus was about to show them the full extent of his love. What it means to really love and how you show that love and what the showing of that love produces 
in the life of people. You see, if the love of God doesn't do anything in our lives, what's the point of the love of God? So here we are in the meal and and they go ahead and eat the food and after the meal, seeing that nothing had happened with the bowl in the corner and the jug and the towel, Jesus gets up and he takes off his outer coat and he wraps the towel around his waist and he goes to the bowl that everybody had avoided in the corner and he takes the jug and he pours the water into the bowl and he puts the towel, tucks the towel into his waist and then he proceeds from there to go and begin to wash his disciples' feet and dry them with the towel that was round his waist. Now you have to understand that, that this action in Jewish culture was always performed by the lowest of the low, by the servant, by one who wasn't anything, who had to get down in the dirt and get the dirt off the feet of everybody else. So the issue was none of Jesus' disciples wanted to do that, even though they knew that there were a lot of dirty feet in that room. Nobody wanted to attend to the dirty feet. Jesus would have willingly done this at the beginning, but you see, he wanted to wait because he needed to teach his disciples something. And sometimes I think God holds back in our lives to let stuff happen that is messy with us to show us that nobody bothered to go to the bowl in the corner. Everybody wanted someone else to take care of what was happening in their life rather than being kind about something that was happening in someone else's life. And he comes to Simon Peter. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, Peter was pretty vocal, pretty boisterous, pretty pushy. There are some Peters in here tonight. And he comes to Simon with the bowl, ready to wash Simon's feet. And Simon questioned, argued, and then got all hyper-spiritual and has ever missed the point. He started saying, oh, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, don't realize, do you not realize what I'm doing? Sorry, you don't realize what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. I want to say something about that. Will you please listen to me and learn? Some things happen in your life that you will not and cannot understand Now, but later, you will understand. Now, the problem is if Peter says, I won't let this happen now, he's never going to understand it because he never allowed it to happen. So he would have walked away unchanged because he didn't realise some things in our lives we don't understand at the moment. Somebody with greater wisdom and understanding is speaking to us and helping us and we have to have the humility to allow that to happen in our lives lives because at some point we will understand. Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. I hate hyper-spirituality. I hate it when we come to the crux of an issue that people Bring out their spiritual thing. Oh, well, I've just been having such a wonderful time with the Lord and the way the Lord's doing them. So it just drives me absolutely nuts. It's like, just shut up with the hyper-spiritual thing and get real. Let's just talk. Let's talk about your life. Let's talk about my life. Let's talk about how God will help us and free us and deliver us without throwing up that smoke screen of religion. If you don't learn that, you leave the room unchanged and unwashed. Jesus said to him, a person who's had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean and you're clean, though not every one of you. The issue was Jesus was saying, Peter, just shut up a minute and listen to me. This is not about the bigger picture of whether God loves you, whether God has forgiven you, whether there is purpose in your life. Because the truth is you can know that and life still not work. He said it's about the little things that you don't want to deal with. 
And what so often spoils our life is not the big issue, does God love me? It's often the little issue that says, but I can't forgive myself. It's not the big issue of, does God have a plan? It's the little issue that I can't get on with this person. And so Peter tries all these things, questioning, arguing, getting hyper-spiritual, and, and as he ever was prone to do, missed, totally missed the point of what was happening. Now, this was the same Peter who tried to obstruct Jesus' mission and purpose and would soon disown him and deny him and run away, but Jesus wanted to wash his feet. You see, when we're not driven by the love that God talks about that comes in Christ, our love and the release of that love is motivated by deserve or don't deserve. And it manifests in all kinds of ways. I'm not going to church today, why? Because I'm upset and I'm angry and they don't deserve it. So, so our love says, it's not by deed, it's only by word. And so many things we do to one another and with one another and in our relationships. Do you know what? Some of you have never had conversations about stuff you ought to have had a conversation about. I wish sometimes we could have been like the Kardashians. I would have liked the money, because the clothes I like need that kind of money. <laughs> because I would love you to see. The Apostle Paul said quite boldly, but not arrogantly, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Or in other words, he was saying, listen, I'm happy for you to bring the cameras in on my life, to watch my failures, my faults, my errors, my issues, as well as how God has touched me and how I have touched the heart of God and how we together have walked this journey. Because the same Paul who said, follow me as I follow Christ, was not being arrogant because he said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. If you want to see somebody who knows how to sin well, watch me, Paul was saying. But he also said, if you want to know someone who is what he is by the grace of God, watch me. Put the camera on my life. And some of you would be shocked at the conversations, the challenges, the questions that have happened in our home over the years, in good times and in bad. Some of you have never asked the questions you should have asked. That's not love. Love speaks up. Love challenges. Love questions. Love talks. And guess what? Then love doesn't walk away. Then love is what covers the multitude of sin. So I have a question. What sin are you covering for somebody? Or are you too busy? I read this this week, which is wonderful. If you ask any Christian to give you a list of 10 sins, it's amazing that their sin's never one of the 10. It's always 10 sins that they're not doing. And all of us are natural tendency as human beings. It's to look at what others are and what others do and put ourselves outside of that category. But that's not love. He washed Peter's feet. In the room that day was also Philip. Jesus wanted to feed a group of people one day. And he'd been with Jesus for some time and he'd listened to Jesus and watched Jesus. And then when Jesus said, I'm going to do this, Philip's answer was, what? That's impossible. His faith level was in the gutter. His doubt and disbelief and distrust. How many times does the lack of trust begin to creep into our relationships. It doesn't affect whether God loves us. It doesn't affect whether God has purpose in our lives, but I'll tell you what, it sure can shatter our relationship. It sure can stop us loving back. And yet here we've got Philip, who distrusted Jesus in that moment, but Jesus washed Philip's feet as well. James and John were there. 
James and John were always manoeuvring to gain an advantage in the power stakes of the group. I know some Peters, I know some Phillips, and I know some James and Johns. I had an encounter this week that was a James and John type encounter. Manoeuvring to gain advantage in the power stake, love titles, love positions. Going to throw your teddy out of the pram if you're just not recognised, take your ball home. If I can't do what I want to do, I'm not going to do anything. James and John, Jesus washed their feet. And then guess what? A guy called Judas was there. In just a few short hours, Judas would go and betray this Jesus who had included him, loved him, made him the treasurer of the organization even though he was a thief to show his trust and his belief that he could still change. Judas was there. Jesus washed his feet. And the rest of the disciples, Thomas and Bartholomew, all had their quirks and twists. But Jesus did not distinguish or delineate between them. He simply started at one end of the room and he washed all 24 feet that were in that room with the same passion, with the same vigour, with the same intensity, with the same kindness, with the same love, just like he does in here tonight. Knowing how quirky and freaky and dysfunctional and disenfranchised you are and I am. Knowing that as he's washing your feet, you're angry, you're mad as hell. Knowing as he washes your feet, you're full of bitterness and unforgiveness. Knowing as he washes your feet that you'll gossip about how he did it as soon as you get out of the room. You'll be on Facebook saying, Jesus thinks he's a good foot washer, but he's a rubbish foot washer. He didn't do my feet right. You'll do it. We're like that. But Jesus, knowing all that, still washes their feet because he's bringing them to a different understanding of what love really is. And the truth of the gospel is God brings us to a different understanding of what love really is. And until you've caught that, you have not caught the heart of Jesus. And when you do catch the heart of Jesus, you'll let your feet be washed and you'll wash the feet of others. So is it about us literally washing one another's feet? God forbid. I, people who want to be podiatrists and what's the other one? Chiropodists. You're a perv. Sorry. <laughs> You, your lift does not go all the way to the top. I, I mean, God bless doctors, I think they're lovely, but there are certain kinds of people, if they came to my doctor's surgery, I'd like, ain't no way I'm examining you, forget it, put your clothes on, goodbye. Feet, as far as feet go, I mean, just no, just, it's just not right. You see, to us today, and and I've watched people do this, and I think with good hearts and sometimes maybe right, there was a phase in the church at one point about, you know, you couldn't turn up at a meeting without somebody wanting to wash your feet. You know, you're the leader and I'm going to get before you. I I, I have to let you into a secret. The couple of times that's been going to happen here, I've said, you... Oh, I want to do something. What is it you're going to do? I can't tell you. I'll do it. Are you going to try and wash my feet? Well, I can't. Are you going to try? Yes. Well, you ain't doing it. Forget it right now. I accept the sentiment. Very nice. Wonderful. But I really don't need you to do that. Okay? So that's how I feel about it. So what you have to understand is today in our culture here, it has no physical significance. Okay? So it's not about you going and getting a ball now and washing somebody else's feet. It's not necessary. Does it mean something else for us? The answer to that is yes, it means something else for us. What was the reason that people had their feet washed? It wasn't because they were dirty people. It was because of the grunge, grit and grime, not to mention the donkey poop and the rest, that they had picked up on the journey. It was about what you had picked up 
on the journey. It was about Jesus' concern for what you picked up just walking through the street, just living your life, just being a family, just being at work, just being in college. It's what you picked up in your interactions with life that Jesus was wanting to deal with because that's what needed to be washed away because if it wasn't, it was going to cause a social, emotional and spiritual problem. It's the stuff of life that sticks to our sweaty efforts to advance through life is what Jesus was driving at. What sticks to our sweaty efforts to advance through life. Stuff sticks. And now feet, what touches life, gets just as dirty as those disciples' feet that day and every other person who walked the dusty, grimy, poop-ridden streets of Jerusalem. But Jesus was willing to touch the stinky, ugly parts of our lives, and still is. There are times, nice though I am, that you'll touch stinky, ugly parts in my life. The test becomes not what you thought of me when I was lovely, the test becomes what you think of me when I'm stinky and ugly. And whether your concern is enough that you would get down with me and take care of the stinkiness and the ugliness because you love me enough that you would do anything for love and not say, but I won't do that. Because if there ever was a place where Meat Love Song would have fit, it would have been in that room today because those disciples who left the ball in the corner were saying, I'd do anything for love, but I won't do that. It's not my job. It's not my role. It's not my function. It's not my responsibility. In fact, I should have my feet taken care of by you. You should recognize that it's your job to serve me. And if you don't serve me, then I'll leave your house offended. I would do anything for love. But would you do that? You see, our reactions are very often not in response to a big event. Although the th you may think they are, actually they're not. Our reactions are very often not in response to a big event, but usually the culmination of lots of little things that we never allowed to be washed away or we wouldn't wash away from others. Broken relationships, marred associations, hurting hearts, unforgivenesses, bitternesses, resentments, offences are rarely the result of one big thing. It's the culmination of all these little things that we never allowed to be washed away or wouldn't wash away from others. It's happening right now. In this building. In homes that you're going home to. In conversations that are taking place and will take place. In non-conversations where what should be said is not being said. It's happening. The wounds are starting. The offense is building up. The bitterness is coming. The feet are getting dirty and stinky. It's happening on Facebook. Lots of pointing out of what the problem is. If we don't take the spirit of Jesus, ultimately those things separate, divide, cause bitterness, anxiety, and judgment. And we struggle to really know the love of God because we won't let these things be dealt with in our lives or deal with them in the lives of others. If I have been to you stinky and ugly, if you feel that my feet are covered in poop and the dust of life that is an offense to you, then wash them. If you think somebody else is like that, then go wash them. 
or in humility get down and do something to wash away those little things that have built up over the years that have become crusty and horrible and disgusting and vile that are about to separate because you can't be in the same room with that person. You can get so stinky and filthy that people would say, I'm going in the same room with that person. That happens with us in life. People don't want to be with people because we never loved enough to wash their feet or we never loved enough to let our own feet be washed by someone else. So what's the call to action? Verse 14, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, right? Got down to deal with the grime that you've picked up in the everyday process of life, humbled myself to get to grips with that, you also should wash one another's feet. One another means everybody who's not you. Doesn't mean your mate, your friend, the person you actually like, or the person who agrees with you. It means the Peters, the James and Johns, the Andrews, the Phillips, the Ants, the Chrises, the Chloe's, the Keith's. This is the essence of the love that we said we wanted to give our lives into that very often we fail to express. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Here's the call to action. Be willing to wash people's feet. And remember, this is not about literally washing people's feet, but the grime. Be willing to wash people's feet. And be willing to let your feet be washed. I watch some people come and go in my long life of ministry. And I've been on this long enough to know I can actually read the body language that says, you ain't going to wash my feet. And I watch it happen and I watch the resistance begin to build. And of course, it's not long before in that resistance there is a breakdown of relationship. The breakdown of relationship has come because there came a point where I said, you're not going to wash my feet and I'm not going to wash your feet. It always starts. That's with Jesus' point. It's always going to start at that point. But if you learn to do this, you will build fruitful honest relationships that will bring into this world a love that's not by word, but a love that's by deed. I just throw this in here. Some, you may say, well, how have you washed people's feet? And I'm going to tell you. I'm going to be hopefully like Paul, not arrogant, but honest. I wash people's feet when I am accused and I don't tell you my side of the story. I wash people's feet because I allow you to draw your own conclusions about what it is that he said or what it is that has been done. And I find that as hard as Jesus did to bow down to the feet and get down on those feet. But I am committed to doing it. So you will not have heard me give my side of the story when you know at times there are things out there that are saying something awful must have happened because such and such would never have taken place and this person wouldn't that if something awful hadn't been done. But I will not talk to you about it for this reason that I am seeking to wash those feet. To make opportunity for cleanliness to come and cleanness and wholeness without doing it. And those are the kind of ways in all our different functions that we wash people's feet and cover things for people so that hopefully there might be a response. Now I do want to tell you that after Jesus did this, Peter denied that he'd ever known him. Walked away from him, left him to die alone. And guess what? All the others went with him because he was the loud mouth. James and John as well. John, who supposedly loved Jesus so much, disappeared with the rest of them. Judas, of course, went out immediately after Jesus washed his feet and went and betrayed Jesus. But do you think that Jesus therefore wished he hadn't bothered washing the feet of his disciples? 
Or do you think that in doing what he was doing, he realized that he was creating an atmosphere, an environment, a culture in which something new would envelop? And then you have to see the end of the story, like the song that Beth put up, because the end of the story is they all come back together and they're caught by the love that has been shown to them, which is fully expressed in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross when the Bible said he didn't just wash our feet, but he washed our hearts. Washed all the stuff away that's on the inside of us. Every motive, every issue. He came in Christ to wash us on the inside. Not just the stuff that we picked up outside, but the stuff that's gone on inside. And he gave his life. And suddenly, Peter, who he said, if you let me do this, you'll understand later. Understood later. And thank God he responded and became part of a movement of which we have become the beneficiaries today and which has spread across our world like wildfire, which is the good news about Jesus, the Son of God, who came as the Savior of the world and accomplished what he came to do and rose from the dead and is alive to show that when everything seems to be heading towards death that's not the final answer that's not God's final word and in your life today you might think how am I ever going to turn around the stuff I've picked up the way that I feel but that's why Jesus rose from the dead to say that's not the final story in your story that's not the final event in your story if you follow this through you come to resurrection you come to new life and God allows you to become to people what he has been to you So why? Why this foot washing? Because it's what we have all picked up on our journey that corrupts and divides and separates. And the benefit, that which identifies us with the grunge, the grit, the grime and the poop of our journey does not dictate who we are today and tomorrow. Did you get that? When we wash someone's feet, And when we allow our own feet to be washed, the stuff we've picked up, that which identifies us with the grunge, the grit, the grime and the poop of our journey does not dictate who we are today and tomorrow. Jesus came to make you free. Without it, you will smell of everything you ever stepped in and you'll leave dirty footmarks on every life you visit. I want that to sink in. Without the foot washing, you will smell of everything you ever stepped in and leave dirty foot marks on every life you visit. How many of you would like to have clean feet tonight? How many would like everybody who is involved in your life to have clean feet? See, washing stinky, dirty feet is unpleasant. And admitting to have stinky, dirty feet is humbling. But if you truly love, you can't say, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. I want us to be different. I am disappointed at encountering so often the won't do that bit. And then we all experience the results of the won't do that bit. So I don't want your song to be, I'd do anything for love, but I won't do that. But I'd do anything for love, including that. So what is stopping you doing what love demands? And are you prepared to wash that away? Are you prepared to let God empower you tonight to wash that away so that you're part of a community that is loved and who loves? You are an individual who is loved And who loves? Because first and foremost tonight, you let Jesus wash your feet. I'm going to tell you one last little story here to help you with this. My wife once said to somebody in in the heat of a, a discussion, which wasn't extremely pleasant, 
It's obvious then that I've upset you. Will you please forgive me? Now, for me, there's a simple answer to that. Yes, I will. No, I won't. But here was the answer. I can't believe that you're accusing me of having something in my heart for which I will not forgive. So a request for forgiveness now turned into an accusation which embitters the heart and can only ever finish up in one place. Why am I saying, telling you this? I, I, I'm telling you this because very often we don't want to be honest in our own lives. We, 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 don't, we, we, we don't, to be humble enough to say I need Jesus to wash my feet means that you're acknowledging that your feet are stinky and grimy. And some of us don't want to do that. And that's why Peter did what he did. But what a joy when you actually say, okay, Jesus, if you say you want to wash your disciples' feet and I'm one of your disciples, then it would appear my feet need washing. Because this was never about, I've told you, God's love, his salvation towards you. He said, this is about the stuff. And if you'll be willing tonight to say, Jesus, yeah, do you know what? My feet are stinky and gritty and grimy and gungy. I've picked up stuff. I've stood in poop and it's still there and I smell it every day, but I do nothing about it. If you're willing to do that, then the same Jesus who knelt down with his disciples tonight kneels down in front of you, humbles himself in your presence and says, I'll wash your feet. I'll pick up the bowl from the corner. And then he'll say to you when he's finished, now in the same way that I've done this for you, you go do it for your brothers. How many of you would like to live in a community like that? That's the community of believers that Jesus came to create. And I'm done with the other nonsense. That's where I want to live, it's where I want to be, and it's where I want to be with you and where I want you to be with me. Let's just bow our heads for one moment. If, if it helps some of you tonight, while our heads are bowed, and just before we close, if it helps some of you in the prayer we're about to pray about Jesus washing our feet, if it helps some of you to stand where you are in order to make a stand and a real commitment to say, Jesus, yeah, I, I just, I've got to make a movement that says I'm really serious about my feet being washed. If, if it would help you to do that, I want to give you opportunity to do that right now. You, you're welcome to stand. If you really want to say, Jesus, this is important to me tonight. It's important that the stuff I've picked up on my journey gets washed off my feet. It's important to me. And tonight I need you to do a miracle, first of all, in me before I can pass that on. If, if you'd like to stand, you need to stand right now because I'm going to pray in just a second. Because I know that he wants to deal with some of the stuff that's been on your feet for longer than you can remember. You know, self-condemnation is the grime we pick up on our feet from what others have said about us. Now we think it should be. That's the grime he wants to wash away and bring life and help you to understand you are clean from the stuff that you picked up on the path. It might mean you've got to have the conversation. It might mean you've, some of you've got to shut up. It might mean some of you've got to love. Some of you've got to talk. Some of you've got to give some hugs. Some of you've got to give you time. You've got to do what? In washing the feet of others, but we're going to pray right now, and I'm going to pray for you for a miracle, because I know how troublesome this can be. How we kind of smell ourselves every day. I think if only I could get rid of this. Well, we're going to pray and a miracle is going to happen tonight. Father, in Jesus' name right now, I pray over every life represented here. I pray over every person who stood 
to their feet today, thanking you that what you did physically for your disciples 2,000 years ago, you do spiritually and in the spirit for us today. That you've come to cleanse from our feet the stuff we picked up on the journey that's made us have the problems that we're now having. In Jesus' name right now, I declare everyone in here, the feet are clean, your feet are washed. The stuff is gone. It's dealt with. It's taken away in the love of Jesus. The love of Jesus is bigger than the stuff that you're carrying and love covers a multitude of sins and you've now got to let that love which has come into you wash that away and stop hanging on to it because that's no good to you. But his love right now is removing that from you and freeing your heart in Jesus' name. I speak freedom over every life in here tonight in Jesus' name and lift the burden. Let it go right now. Don't hang on to it. Don't do a, not my feet, Lord. Let it go right now. You're forgiven. You're washed. You're clean. And we're not carrying that stuff any further into our life. We're having a new start today and a new hope for tomorrow because Jesus washed our feet. Receive it right now and thank him in your heart for doing it. Thank him for making you whole. Thank him for dealing with the past. Thank him that you're accepted and loved and forgiven. And I want to say to everybody in here today, serious, Jesus said, what you've seen me do, I want you to go and do the same. My question to you is, are you willing? My question to you is, what is stopping you doing what love demands, then let love have what it demands and life will come. So Father, I speak blessings on the house tonight. Let your word sit in us in such a way that it changes us and helps us become different people who love in deed and not in word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're done.